We're talking about the content of the universe. That's our goal. And how is it that the matter, this content in the universe, how does it actually interact with everything else? And just to be obvious about it, we're really after a theory of everything in this context. Okay? We want to understand the entire content matter of the universe. The basic idea of particle physics is that the interactions that we have are governed by particle exchange. The tools that we're using are called quantum field theory. And now you probably started your clock at 35 seconds because I said quantum field theory. Right? But the basic line is that there isn't magic in interactions. So if you and I are going to have some kind of an interaction, if I want to make you like lunge forward, go back, there has to be some exchange of information. And with particle physics, if we're both representing particles, I could chuck another particle at you. Right? I could throw a basketball at you and make you go back. I could also, in the world of particle physics, throw a basketball at you and have it be communicating an attractive force that makes you lunge forward. But the bottom line is that two things are going to be interacting, two particles. There needs to be an exchange that allows that interaction to happen. We're doing fairly well in some ways. We have a standard model of particle physics, and it contains these particles in categories, okay? We have a set of quarks. We have different force-carrying particles. Maybe you've heard of some of them, maybe not all. This is the photon here you've probably heard of. W and Z bosons, maybe a little bit less. And then we also have leptons, which includes the familiar electron, all right, family of particles here that we've organized in reasonable ways. And we're aware of four fundamental forces. So the first thing that I want to go through, want to do, is go through each of these forces quickly and make sure that people are happy with them, okay? And actually, one of the primary goals that I have in almost every talk I give is that people who walk out of the room, if you're stopped on the street and somebody says to you, defend for me the strong force's existence, that you'll be able to get out of that interaction. <laughs> you never know when that will happen. <laughs> Let's start with maybe the easiest one here, the electromagnetic force. No one's going to argue with me that that doesn't exist. We have refrigerator magnets, right? People are familiar with that. Some of us actually work with 25 Tesla magnets um, here at, at UVM, so some people are very familiar with that. What about the weak force, though? Back to my undergraduates. The weak force, is that one familiar? Yeah, you've heard of it? If you had to defend that in this room, for example, if I were you, I would say radioactive decay. In order to have radioactive decay, you need to have the weak force, okay? So everybody maybe will give me that. It's taking one object, one kind of particle, and having all of a sudden in its place different kinds of particles, all right? That process can change. We call it decay, which makes it sound like it's a process. It's really more of a now you see it, now you don't um, switch that's kind of more on and off. But anyway, the weak force is radioactive decay. Now the strong force. This is the tricky one, right? This is the one where you might be stopped on the street, you know, potentially by me, because I didn't come back and visit. <laughs> the strong force. How do you defend the strong force? Well, let me do it for you. You know, we're supposed to wait like three or four seconds when we ask questions and then see what happens, but I don't have that, that, um, I don't have that courage today. One of the worst moments of mine when I was starting out my education did not happen here at University of Vermont. It was in a chemistry classroom when I learned about the structure of the atom. Okay? Do you remember this? I'd already learned that positive like charges, two positive charges, are going to repel. And opposite charges, positive and negative, are going to attract. That's familiar with people, right? And I then was told that the structure of the atom is to take all of the protons and all of the neutrons and cram them into this little space in the middle and have electrons orbiting around outside them, right? And I wrote that down. I drew it in my, my notebook. Okay, why is that a catastrophic memory for me? Well, all of the protons positive charges, repelling, don't want to be anywhere near each other. Let's just cram them all right into the middle of the nucleus of the atom and have them hang out, right? How is that supposed to work? It's actually the strong force that gets us out of that dilemma. These protons are repelling each other, they don't want to be near each other, but the very well-named gluons are the force-carrying particle of the strong force, this G right here, and it's the, the gluons 
that are actually holding the protons together, the quarks inside, and interacting between neighboring protons and serving as the glue that keeps that nucleus together of, of the atom, right? It also gives you some sense of um, the amount of energy that's locked inside the atom, in the nucleus of the atom, thinking about all of these protons that don't want to be near each other actually crammed into that tiny space in the middle. Okay, and then I get to my first confession and a series of confessions, and that is that gravity is not in the standard model of particle physics. We do not have a quantum theory of gravity. And you might think that that's embarrassing uh, for a confession because we've known about gravity for a very long time, right? But the reality is gravity is an extremely weak force compared to these other forces. So I'm not that embarrassed confessing it in front of all of you. And to demonstrate that, I think we can think about, um, for example, the gravitational interaction between my hand and this table right here, okay? If I stand here with my eyes closed and my hand near it, I close my eyes and you take the table away, I, I have to say that I'm not going to notice through a gravitational force that it's gone, right? The strength of that gravitational force is not very much. But my hand, which is mostly space, and the table, which is mostly space, have this happen if I try to pass my hand through the table. And that's electricity and magnetism, basically. Very, very different in terms of the strength. It's an incredibly strong force that keeps my hand from passing through the table. Gravity an incredibly weak force. And then, of course, there's that 96% of the universe that we actually don't have in the standard model. Okay, so not only are we missing one of the fundamental forces, but we're also missing um, dark energy, which was another recent Nobel Prize in particle physics, which, which has to do with the accelerating expansion of the universe, and also dark matter, not included in the standard model. Okay, it means that we have a lot to do. So there was particle physics for you, all right? in eight minutes. Um, now I want to talk about the Higgs. And this is a little bit of revisionist history, what I'm, what I'm going to say, and I'll, I'll explain when I'm doing that. Um, the Higgs field, 1964, there actually were a number of papers that were written. If you've um, read the Nobel announcement, you saw that it, it wasn't just Peter Higgs who was given the prize. Higgs and Englert were given the prize. Grout passed away um, very recently, and people believe that if, if he were still alive, he probably also would have received the Nobel. But in, within the same year, there were quite a few people who also did work um, that, that led to this idea. As a University of Rochester graduate, I always have to point out Carl Hagen, who was um, at University of Rochester and instrumental. So the Higgs, you've probably heard about it by now. You're in the room, so you've heard about it. It's not what were, was on people's minds in 1964. Okay, but the way we imagine the Higgs and think about it, and the way it fits into our standard model right now, um, is what I'm about to say. Now, before I go into any of this, I um, need to acknowledge I've spent a lot of my days speaking with condensed matter physicists who have a lot to, who have a lot to teach particle physicists about bosons. I think so. I just want to make sure that we're all one big happy family here as I continue. I want to acknowledge the condensed matter physicists in the room. And actually, I'm married to one, so I <laughs> always be that kind of general statement. But condensed matter physicists are this. From the particle physics perspective, here's the problem you have the standard model of particle physics. It has particle content, and it has interactions between these particles through different forces, okay? And here's the problem mass. Some of these fundamental particles have mass, and some of them don't. And how do you get that into the standard model? How do you write down that mathematics? How do you do it? Attempts at that broke Lorentz invariance, meaning they broke Einstein's special relativity. Okay? Um, and people came up with this idea. Here's an idea. What if there's a field everywhere in the universe that we haven't seen yet, we haven't detected it yet, but what if there's this field everywhere that we haven't seen? Maybe that would get us out of this dilemma of giving some of these particles mass and not giving other particles mass. Okay, so let me back up a little bit and tell you what a massless fundamental particle is, what that means. By definition, a particle that's massless is traveling at the speed of light. And you know, probably, that a particle that has mass can't travel at the speed of light. Okay, so you can think about mass as a slowing down of particles. So basically the question becomes, why are all particles not moving at the speed of light? How can we slow some of them down? The idea of just imagining a field everywhere in the universe that we haven't detected yet, 
I mean, I would like to say that when I lose my keys, you know? Maybe there's a field everywhere in the universe that just eats keys, right? We <laughs> haven't seen it yet, but that would explain why I'm losing my keys repeatedly. It's very rarely the correct answer to a mystery, to imagine a field anywhere in the universe. And that actually is fairly preposterous, if you think about that leap, right? But the idea is, the particles that travel through this field, they have, um, that have no interaction with the field, those are our massless particles that move at the speed of light. Other particles that do have mass, as they move through this field that we haven't seen yet, as they move through it, they're interacting, and those interactions slow them down and mean they can't move at the speed of light. And the strength of that interaction with the field actually is the definition of mass for fundamental particles. Okay? That's the basic idea of, of the Higgs mechanism. Um, it's really taken off. These were all images taken before the, the um, discovery. The Higgs particle responsible for giving mass to other particles. This allows me to, to let you know the Higgs gives mass to fundamental particles. My mass comes primarily from gluon fields, actually. Um, there, are, there is mass in interaction, so the mass of macroscopic things doesn't come fully only through the Higgs. We have this name of the God particle that some people have heard. Um, and actually, I told this story, and I was hoping it would make it on the radio, but it might not have been quite PC. I was interviewed for VPR. I feel like a rock star. <laughs> I've never done a radio interview. <laughs> but he asked me about the God particle, and if I've ever gotten into theological battles because of this name of, of the Higgs. And it allowed the people heard this name associated with the Higgs. Leon Letterman co-wrote a book. Do you know the story behind it? Yeah. Yeah, he down. wanted to name the book the Goddamn Particle. <laughs> <laughs> said, you know, no, I'm sorry, that's not going to fly. What a great marketing idea, you know, the God Particle instead. Um, so the Goddamn Particle, the name of that came from the fact that it's been so hard to find. Been looking for this thing, looking for this thing, you know, it's expensive. <laughs> okay, the cocktail party, what people are thinking of, you know, with the Higgs boson comes out. So you have scientists thinking we will be able to understand how matter holds together, the military thinking we will have new weapons, no Higgs bombs on the horizon, sorry to disappoint. And then the public thinking, gosh, wonder what Kim Kardashian is doing right now. This one, I have to say, not only am I annoyed that it's the only woman in the cartoon, it's totally wrong. It's been amazing how interested the public has been in the Higgs, as evidenced by all of this. Higgs goes on, so there's mass, there are lots of jokes about mass and Catholic, you know, Catholic ceremonies in front of the Higgs. This one, some small fraction they get and really like, you know, yes, right, people who get this like it. Um, people who play with 42, it's the end, and the Hitchhiker's Guide, the answer to the, yeah, okay. If you don't get it, it's okay, it's, it's okay. Good for you. Um, the famous person analogy is um, the result of a prize that went out. The, the Higgs actually was hard enough to explain for people um, that there was a contest, a really nice bottle of champagne for the person who came up with the best explanation of the Higgs and how it works. Um, I like to describe the Higgs in terms of the speed of light, uh, but you'll notice that I, there's a problem with what I told you about it. I've been talking about the Higgs fields. I haven't yet mentioned the Higgs boson itself. Right? Um, it's, it's a layer past understanding the Higgs fields to get to the Higgs boson, so it actually requires a little bit of explanation. Um, okay, so here's the analogy. People standing around at a cocktail party, they represent the Higgs field. A famous person, usually traditionally Margaret Thatcher, currently Obama, depends on what audience you're in, who you use. A famous person, Kim Kardashian, walks into a room and the Higgs field, the people clump around her and make it very difficult for her to move through the room, okay? Slowing her down. She's a massive particle. The more famous you are, the more mass you have as a particle. That's the analogy. And then normally, before I did my VPR interview, I would have said, you know, I walk into a room and I don't have a problem as a non-famous person. I march right through and maybe that's okay because my picture wasn't, um, wasn't on the video. There's only three minutes, I'm so excited. So. <laughs> Right, so I'm not a famous person. I can walk through the room at a cocktail party without an issue. I don't interact with the Higgs field. That's like a massless particle. So what is the boson? What's the Higgs particle itself in this picture? That's as if a rumor enters the room. Somebody whispers on the corner, in the corner room, Obama's here. Obama's outside. 
And that rumor, con people are congregating, passing that rumor along, okay? That congregation of people without the particle that, that actually is interacting with the field, that's the, the Higgs boson. I like to think, it's, it's basically an excitation of the universe. You have to, um, if, if this um, Higgs field actually exists, the question is, you know, how are we actually going to say that it exists? How are we going to have evidence for the fact that this field we haven't seen is there? Well, if the field exists, if you excite it, if you hit the surface of a lake and send a wave off, if you add energy to the Higgs field by colliding protons with really high energy, um, you actually can create this excitation, this Higgs boson particle. And if we create and see the particle, then we have some evidence that the Higgs field exists. All right? That's the, the, the translation. We have this field everywhere, how to see it, excite it. And if you excite it, you can actually measure the, the particle that comes out. Okay. And here we go. This is the money clock, quite literally. All right, I, I said that I wanted to say something about how it is that we convinced the world to let us build this. Um, um, Valerie's not calling it the one trillion dollar machine. It's actually seven billion dollars. I need to correct that one right here. There's so many zeros, and these people stop counting. But how, how did this happen? So now is your time to do a little bit of work and be patient with me. There's a lot of information on this plot. Okay? Before we turn on the LHC, this is what we need. We're going hunting for the Higgs boson, this particle that will be evidence of the existence of the Higgs field. It's a particle that has mass itself, and we don't know what the mass of the particle is. We don't know the mass of the Higgs. We're looking for it. On this axis, mH is the mass of the Higgs, okay? From 30 to 300 GeV. So this is a plot that spans potential masses that the Higgs boson might be, all right? in units of GeV, and you'll notice it's not a linear scale, meaning this much space here doesn't equal this much space here, okay? But anyway, masses of the Higgs being scanned, okay. Um, a little bit more information on the plot. People have been looking for the Higgs for 55 years, right, before turning on the LHC. So this region in yellow is actually where they looked and not seen it. They excluded the Higgs being at those masses, okay? So the Higgs is not <coughs> between 30 and 115 GeV. This is 2008 when we're about to turn on the LHC. More information on this plot here, we have the lines, right? These lines right here take everything we've measured in the standard model. A couple of different lines using low energy, some of them using low energy data, some of them not, uh, and some uncertainty on these lines, these bands, uncertainty in terms of measurements and also the theory predictions. You throw everything we've measured and if the Higgs particle is there, it's interacting with other particles. It's adding information to the system. It has to be taken into account. So we have a very loose prediction for what the Higgs mass should be. And you get that prediction by taking these lines and minimizing them. It's a delta chi-squared, so it's minimizing the chi-squared for a fit, for those of you who have done statistical analysis. Right? And you see that minimum of these lines comes in right here, and that says most likely prediction of the mass of the Higgs boson given the information that we have so far. It puts the prediction of the mass of the Higgs between 80 and 100 GeV-ish. And what happens as you go in either direction in mass from that minimum is that it's less and less consistent with all of the other measurements that we've done, okay? So as you come up here and look at higher masses, it looks less and less possible and is less and less a standard model of Higgs boson. It doesn't fit with everything that we have. This is a personality test in 2008, right? You look at this plot and you say, you've ruled out the standard model Higgs boson, preferred mass, it's in real trouble. Yeah? I mean, what's up? It's, it's not where it ought to be. Other people saying, we've ruled out the most likely version and man, we are about to see it, right? It's just, it must be right on this edge. If it's anywhere, it's gotta be right here. And the thing about the LHC is, it was gonna cover the Large Hadron Collider it's going to give us the data to cover this whole area and way beyond above 300, okay? We knew, assuming things didn't continue blowing up as we tried to run the machine, which happened in 2008, we knew that we were going to either find the standard model Higgs or rule it out. Because if you've gotten up to here and beyond and you haven't seen it, you're no longer consistent with the, the uh, measurements that we have in the theory. Okay, is that clear? All right, so you turn on the machine in 2009 again, and you take data and you see what's the answer. Is the Higgs the, the, the you know, explanation for fundamental particles getting mass or not? 
So what did we turn on? There's a long history of, of extreme behavior in science. Um, I don't have time to go into very much of it, but you know about scientists heading up in hot air balloons and climbing mountains and sailing across oceans to take measurements? I mean, there's a long history of people going to extremes. And we're still doing that in many ways. Um, particle physics tends to build very big things with very large collaborations. This is part of the Atlas experiment, one of the MCAPs that, that's um, crossing the street in Switzerland. This is the Katrina experiment. It's a neutrino experiment making its way through um, a town in Germany. People described the clearance that it had in units of millimeters. It was not moving quickly through this town. These people are not running from the emergency. <laughs> Neutrinos are particles that I, I also don't have time to talk much about, but they don't interact very much with matter, okay? So in order to see them, you need really a lot of area or, or volume for them to pass through, potentially. And I don't know if you can see these little people on the boat, but what's happening is the, the water is very slowly filling up this tank, and those, I'm not sure if they're graduate students, they're going around very slowly and actually cleaning the surfaces of all of the photo tubes. <laughs> which I'm sure is a really cool job. <laughs> right? okay. So the level of, of um, crazy that we're doing at the Large Hadron Collider really has to do with the scale and the energies that we're accessing. We're smashing particles together. So the first question you might ask is, why are you smashing particles together? I mean, we're smashing particles together because we need <coughs> energy in order to create the, you know, E equals MC squared. We take that energy and we can create the mass of the Higgs boson. And I do have to point out that the Higgs is one of hundreds of things that we're trying to measure and do at the LHC. It's getting the most publicity, but it's by no means the only thing we're doing there, or even my group is doing there, so I'd be happy to talk about other things as well. Um, why, why protons? Why smash what we're smashing? Well, the beautiful thing and the terrible thing about the LHC is that we're not smashing fundamental particles together. So we have had, at different points of history, and there are still active electron-positron machines that collide fundamental particles, okay? This down here is a proton. If you're a theorist, a particle theorist, a proton for you is an infinite sea of quarks and gluons. It's really a mess. So why collide something that's really a mess compared to a fundamental particle? And why does this mean that we can call it a discovery machine? Well, if I'm colliding two protons at high energies, I know the energies of each of the protons. But I don't know what the energy is of the actual collision itself. Because what happens is a quark or a gluon from one proton interact with the quark or gluon from the other proton. And those partons, we call them, carry some fraction of the energy of the proton. Okay? So I have a one TeV proton. I have a quark or a, a gluon that's interacting that maybe carries 100 GeV, some fraction of that, right? And those things collide. Well, that's um, unfortunate from the perspective of doing an experiment, because you've lost information about the initial center of mass energy, right? The beautiful thing is, if you don't know what the mass of the Higgs boson is, you're for free scanning a lot of different energies, a lot of different masses, okay? It's a discovery machine. We're going looking for something. We don't know the mass of it, so let's cover a lot of ground. And the other nice thing about it is, in terms of the richness of the physics program it can support, we're colliding all kinds of different flavors of quarks and gluons. So it's, it's a lot of richness in terms of the different processes we can see, okay? We're scanning different energies, and we're scanning different initial states of particles. So there's a lot of physics that can happen. So how am I going to actually accelerate these things? We have to design the LHC together. How am I actually going to accelerate a proton? If you want to accelerate something, what, what's your plan? Force fields. Force fields. Excellent. Okay. I mean, if I have to accelerate myself, I'm in a gravitational field, right? I have something stopping me, but I could be in a gravitational field for a period of time without anything stopping me. The longer I'm in the field, the faster I go. Um, the protons, what kind of a force? you want to deal with? Electric exactly. Electricity and magnetism. The protons have charge. So what we can do is we can actually put them in an electric field. Okay? So they're positively charged. If I have a positive charge here, it's going to be pushed over in this direction, and it's going to be basically, you can think about it, it's falling, right? It's going to be picking up speed heading in this direction until what happens? It slides. 
slams through this, right? That's unfortunate. But what if, right when it gets here, I flip this sign from being negative to being positive, and as it's going, I keep always pushing it in that direction, and I have some, uh, some um, negative over here, that becomes positive, this becomes negative. Maybe you see where this is going. Okay? So if I'm starting out positive, negative, positive, I'm pushing this thing in this direction, and, um, and you see this picture here, but as it passes through this, I've flipped the polarity. Okay, I'm oscillating what sign these different bars have. This is basically mm -hmm. a, linear, a linear accelerator that, that we have right here. Now, one thing you notice is that these are not evenly spaced, <coughs> right? What happens is as your proton is traveling in a linear accelerator, it's picking up speed. So if I want to flip these, the, this at some given rate, as it's picking up speed, it's going to be going faster and faster, so I need to make these things further and further apart, okay? So the cavities that you have here have different sizes. That's the basic idea of uh, a linear accelerator. Now, you don't only have linear accelerators, but the LHC is an example of a circular accelerator. It's actually, as you'll see soon, the last in a chain of accelerators. We do have some linear accelerators at the CERN accelerator complex that we're using. So, why a circular accelerator? Why, why do that? Well, with a linear accelerator, I get one shot, okay? You can make them very long. The machines they're talking about building in Japan are like a mile long, all right? Very, very long accelerator, very, very high fields. You can get things going really fast. And keeping in mind, the faster you have these particles going, in the collision, the more kinetic energy you have access to, and the more new space you're exploring from the physics perspective, or the closer back to Big Bang conditions you're going, it's just good to have higher energy available. The circular accelerator allows me to keep my object in this, um, in this field accelerating for a very long period of time, okay? which is great. The bad news is I also have to steer these things. It means that you also have to have, how would you steer these things? Magnets. You can steer a charged particle with magnets, that's right. And it's a tricky game because as they get faster and faster, you actually have to turn up the magnetic fields perfectly so that you keep these things screening around in this line. The LHG is 18 miles around, and it can get to 14 TeV of energy. If we had stronger magnets that we could afford, stronger magnets that we could make in bulk, we could get to higher energy because we could keep these things in, in the line. But we're at the, at the limits, basically, of the magnet technology that we can afford to keep and have in terms of thousands of magnets around this ring. Um, and, and keep these things in, in the circle. Okay, so here, positives, we don't need magnets, we get only one shot though. Um, circular accelerator, you need magnets, but we get to hang on to the particles for a long time. The type of fundamental particle or non-fundamental particle you're dealing with also comes in here. There are a lot of other details to worry about. I want to just mention one quick application of accelerators that doesn't have directly to do with particle physics. This is a, a design that was developed at CERN for accelerating protons. Um, many hospitals now are looking at putting proton accelerators into their basements um, or you know, building separate um, machines for them. How many hospitals have proton accelerators now? Do you know? I mean, a handful probably yeah, at this point, but lots of places are looking to do it. Um, the thing about the proton beam, and actually beams of particles in general, is that you can control them really well. And if someone has a tumor that's in a location that's inoperable, like um, a lot of tumors in the brain, you can tune a beam of particles to actually um, decay, deposit their energy exactly at the tumor site. Incredible rates of recovery from cancers using beams of particles, all right? And the idea here is, in a very short space and for an affordable amount of money, you want to get um, a, a lot of acceleration of the protons. This is a, a linear accelerator that's operating at 3 gigahertz. This is the rate of flip of polarity, basically, for the, the, um, for the um, cavities here in terms of their fields. And it gets protons from 70 MeV to 200 MeV in 15 meters, which is really incredible. And that 200 MeV lets you access tumors that are at a depth of 20 centimeters. So there are a lot of applications um, outside of particle physics that um, are taking advantage of this. Okay, back to the LHC. Um, you can see here, or maybe you can't, I think you can, there's a series of linear accelerators and a series of circular accelerators that, have, that go into this. The SPS is the, the biggest step right before um, ATLAS. You, you're familiar with the neutrinos that were potentially for a brief period traveling faster than the speed of light? Remember that? The opera experiment? 
Okay, so that beam actually comes from here. Neutrinos come from um, protons extracted at this point from the SPS. The Large Hadron Collider itself is responsible for going from 450 GeV to wherever you have to go. So hopefully up to about 7 TeV. So it's the last step of, of acceleration. I want to point out that a lot of the magnets were actually built at um, Fermilab, which is the only dedicated high energy physics lab that we have left in the US. The magnets are incredibly complicated. Um, and if you think about it, we inject <coughs> protons into this machine. We want to collide protons, right? I want protons to actually smash into each other, which means I need one ring of protons going this way and accelerating. At the same time, and actually, I don't know if I can do this, I can. I need it going in the other direction, right? So your magnets actually need to be providing opposite forces for those two beams. And this is what it looks like, sort of, though it's exaggerated. We have these beams that come in, and they're made to actually pass through each other at a certain point, a few points around the, the ring of the LHC. So my experiment, the Atlas experiment, is built around one of these collision points. But you can see that the magnets, this is a cross-section of the magnets, need to support these two very high magnetic fields that are very close to each other, giving you basically opposite forces. So um, how big is 18 miles around, or 27 kilometers in circumference? I actually went hunting last night for a picture of um, a map of Lake Champlain, because I really wanted to map this out on Lake Champlain so we had some sense of the scale of it. And I didn't find one that was that I was happy with, but I promise it will be my goal. I will keep looking for this so I can project it. Until then, I'll keep using the Grand Canyon. This is my husband and I, um, when I started my postdoc at SLAC out in Stanford, they had me based at CERN, but we drove across the country, got to know that group for a month there before we went out. 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the morning, we actually had this picture taken. I was quite mortified at the time because Steve gave the camera to somebody who was hanging out there and then had us turn around and look in the other direction. I said, Steve, that's really weird. You know, Juan, that's really weird. He said, no, it's totally fine. It's fine. And it's a great picture. Isn't it a great picture? There we are looking out at the Grand Canyon. But I'm not enjoying it. I'm very nervous at that moment. <laughs> in general, I enjoy the moment. All right, the LHC, this is a map of the Grand Canyon. It's the scale of the Grand Canyon. That's how big 18 miles around is for people who've been there, okay? There it is drawn on there. Okay. Um, I mentioned these four points, I think I mentioned, where the beams actually collide, and the Atlas experiment is at one of them. I don't have a lot of time to talk about how particle detectors work, even though it's my, one of my favorite topics in the world, actually. Um, you know, it's no good making these high energy collisions if you can't figure out what happened in that collision, right? We want to know everything about what happened in that collision. We want to know how many particles came out, what kinds of particles came out, what energies did they have? Because we're trying to figure out what actually happened inside there. A particle like the Higgs lives for the teeniest fraction of a second before it decays into other things. So we need to pick out and pick apart all the stuff that come out of those collisions, enough to say, we had Higgs bosons that were produced inside here that gave us some of this, among the many other things we're trying to do at the LHC. The basic strategy of the particle detector is, is an onion idea, mentality, layers of different kinds of technologies that all have different jobs. And when a particle travels out through, so this is the view, you have your, your collisions coming in, it can be any kinds of particles that come in and then fly out. Your particles see this, Right? They first travel through the inner layer, then the other layers. And what you can see from this picture here, without even worrying about what kinds of particles these are, is that the different kinds of particles leave different signatures. And it's a detective game, right? Was this a photon? Was this an electron? What was it probably? You can see, well, what did it do in the tracking chamber? Stuff that's neutral doesn't leave a track. How did it decay? Did it, did it shower in the electromagnetic calendar, the hadronic calendar? And you play this game with your software of trying to figure out, based on these signatures, um, what particles you actually have. And you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Um, and the, the game here is to understand how often you make the mistakes and, and how wrong you often are. And we actually use physics to, um, to let us understand that. Particles that we understand well, we, we find them and use them to calibrate our machine. So the LHC ring is 100 meters underground. 
Um, here's the Atlas detector. I also have to show this to give people permission. You will never have a more tortured acronym than the Atlas experiment. Right? We have an acronym in our acronym. <laughs> this is freedom for you moving forward. It's one of two general purpose machines at the LHC. The other is the CMS detector. Okay? Um, very briefly, they both are going after the Higgs and many other things, and they're very similar at the end of the day in terms of their performance. But different teams built the two experiments. Now, if the Atlas experiment actually finds a Higgs boson or claims that it does, the world is likely skeptical. If the Atlas experiment and the CMS experiment both claim to measure a Higgs boson that they find in the same mass region, the world is probably less skeptical. And it's not as if somebody can go build their own LH LHC and test this, right? When I was learning physics, I remember, I, also here at UVM, when I was taking my lab course, you know, you write down your procedure so that somebody else can follow the steps that you have in your procedure. Well, somebody's not going to be able to build the LHC and check you. So we have to do this right. We have to make sure that we have cross-checks. The magnetic field in the center of the Atlas detector is two Tesla, four Tesla in CMS, okay? Small changes. Atlas is in Switzerland, CMS is in France. Hopefully that's not an impact on <laughs> Very different technology choices for our tracking chambers. CMS is fully silicon technology. Atlas has a transition radiation tracker that was built largely in the US, um, and it's beautiful. It actually gives us both information about where the particles went um, through this kind of impact. See, these are straws as particles fly through. There's an ionization that happens, and, and um, the straws basically light up, literally. There's, there are photons that are released as the particles fly through. It also gives us pion and electron separation. I know I'm flying through this, so you don't have time to, to convince yourself of that, okay? But the TRT both gives us a, the track that we want to see, and, and so that we can count charged particles, and an ID on the particles. The two experiments made very different decisions in terms of the calorimeter technology. Now, calorimeter, do people know what calorimeters do? People are nodding their heads. Wow, okay. It's, it, they measure energy. It's a very uh, barbaric um, method, basically, that we're using at Atlas, in that you basically clobber the particles and you see how far into your calorimeter they pass as you're clobbering them. The more energy they have, the further in they go. That's a very basic um, description. And here's the, the CMS calorimeter. It's a crystal calorimeter. Very expensive. Very beautiful. Beautiful performance. It's largely canceled out because of the amount of material they have in front of it. At the end of the day, the two experiments really are very similar. I have to show this picture. The trigger is what I work on for the experiment. We're looking for rare processes. So we have potentially um, 40 megahertz collision rate. That's every 25 nanoseconds, bunches of protons pass through each other. We can only afford to keep about 200 to 800 of those. So we have a trigger that actually selects some of it in real time, what's interesting and what we should keep. There's a lot of physics that happens with the trigger, so I like that. This is a, a picture that actually um, Micah sent to me. I don't know if you remember this. I emailed my family. I was living in Switzerland. I hadn't seen them in a while. I said, hey, I'm going to be on a shift. We have a webcam. At Atlas, you can see how much work we're doing. You know how hard are they working over there? You can check it out anytime. We're in shutdown right now, so don't be alarmed if the room is largely empty at this point. But um, a couple weeks later, I got an email from Micah, my younger brother, and the caption was "hungry." And if you zoom in, you can see my cheeks are out to here, and my my hand is in front of my face. So <laughs> careful! And it's a total luck. I've always I've never asked you that. Total yeah. luck. Yeah. yeah. Really Not always like that. <laughs> this is the iconic picture of the Atlas detector. It weighs as much as the Eiffel Tower, and this is the muon chambers before the rest of it. Basically, this is the missing Atlas detector, but still the iconic picture before the rest of it was inserted. Um, hundreds of millions of electronic channels. It's six stories high. If you have a chance to see it, I recommend it. We have 3,000 scientists on the collaboration. And we really do um, have our names in alphabetical order on all of our papers. We have more pages of names than we do content, scientific content often. We're one big happy family. We're very excited about what we do. It's not just me. Collectively very excited. This is the first time we saw collisions. And in the last five minutes or so, what I want to do is just show you a little bit of the Higgs data. 
that we have, okay, until it's kind of kicked out here. So um, this is the picture of, of the situation before we turn that, right? Depending on the mass of the Higgs, this is the mass again, this time from 50 GeV to 1000 GeV, we actually know very well how it's going to behave, okay? This is the, the different lines here represent different decay modes of the Higgs. So basically, when the Higgs decays, what does it decay into? Well, tell me your mass, okay, 200 GeV. I just can read up this line and see, well, some fraction of the time it's going to decay to tau tau, other fraction to ZZ, other fraction WW. So basically, given the mass of the Higgs, we know how it should behave. This is really powerful because it lets us tell, is this really the Higgs that we've seen or not? This is according to theory, right? According to theory, yeah. yeah. Um, 125 GeV, by the way, where we actually have found something, is an extremely rich area. See all of the lines that intersect? Really a, a beautiful space for the Higgs to be in. There are four ways that we produce the Higgs in the LHC. These right here are Feynman diagrams, which I've learned today that condensed matter physicists use. I actually didn't know that. Um, the, the gluons are these curls, and the quarks are the cubes, they're the lines, okay? So you can have gluon, gluon fusion, giving you a nice H to Higgs. Quarks here, giving you an H, associated with jets, this is called vector boson fusion. The bottom line is four different ways of producing this particle, and then many different ways of the particle actually decaying. And at Atlas, we basically got a matrix and a CMS of all these different modes of producing the Higgs, the different um, ways of decaying, the, the Higgs decaying, and I like to think of it as special forces that we've assigned to each of these modes, okay, to try to hunt down this particle and see if it behaves as predicted. I'm co-convening the Higgs to Tau Tau group, looking at the Higgs to Tau Tau decays, about 6% of the decays at 125 GeV, where the Higgs is produced in association with a W or a Z. It's a very long title, right? What did we see? Um, and, and where does the sensitivity come from? We have five different modes that we've actually gone looking for it seriously. And the ZZ, Gamma, Gamma, WW are the real workhorses. This is a difficult plot to interpret, but basically um, the line here gives you um, zero standard model Higgs. And deviations down here from the line tell you, boy, what we're seeing in the data is not consistent with zero standard model Higgs, okay? The further away from this point here you get, the more um, certain you are that you've actually seen something. 125 GeV, here's taking all of the channels into account. We're what we call seven sigma, seven standard deviations away from the situation where there is no standard model Higgs. And the gamma gamma line, this is the, the total combined in black. Gamma gamma gets you almost all the way there. There's also Higgs to ZZ that comes in, okay? I'll show you this in a couple of different ways. If you want to read more or, or see more about the analyses, there's a nice Scientific American series of graphics. I said that very carefully. I did not say there's a nice Scientific American article. <laughs> there's a nice Scientific American series of graphics. I have some issues with the article, though it's probably totally fine. What it does is show you the different ways that the Higgs can decay. The theory, or the idea, Higgs going to photons. Well, I have a Higgs, and I have two photons that come out. What does that mean? What's it look like in the detector? It shows you that down here, okay, an example. Which is really nice. It goes through and shows you how we, we put together some of this information. I want to zoom in on just, um, probably I'll just have time to do one. The Higgs again again. I'll do two. Higgs is easy. Here we have our Higgs and it decays to two photons in the detector, okay? This is one of the, the workhorses. The reason it's a workhorse is not because it happens so often. Its branching ratio is 10 to the minus 5. It's a rare process. But it's clean. It's beautifully clean. Two photons coming out. And I haven't told you this, but in a typical high-energy collision in Atlas, we have hundreds of particles that come out. So it really is not easy to, to pick out a complicated signature necessarily. This is what I would call the money plot in this instance. And you're maybe not very impressed. This is possible masses for the Higgs. The data are these dots right here. The dashed red line is our simulation without a standard model case included. And the bold red line is with including a standard model case. That little bump, that's it right there, okay? Um, 
you can see what that looks like here when we just take the difference from this line of where the theory prediction gives you. This is a predicted standard model that hangs at 125 GeV, 126.5, sorry. And here's how the data falls by it. There are really nice, this might be the end of us. Oh, I'm not online, right. There are nice animations that show you what happens as a function of time as we, as we keep taking the data. So I can send that to. Um, and the last one I'll show you leads to ZZ going to four leptons. The red and plus purple is standard model prediction, okay? Standard model prediction without a Higgs. This light blue is what we would have for a standard model Higgs. And you can see the data has this peak right about where the standard model Higgs would give you a peak. Teeny bit of excitement coming from the fact that our, our um, disease Z measurement in terms of the mass on this scale is here, and our gamma gamma is here, and there's a little bit of tension between these two things. It's too early to be excited about that. I think the tension is not strong enough. I mean, in a perfect world, um, there would be something more than just the standard bottle things being going on, going on here. And this is the summary of all the channels that we have so far, okay? From Higgs to BB, Tau Tau, WW, Gamma Gamma, ZZ. And um, this line right here is no standard model Higgs. This line right here is the standard model Higgs exactly with the predicted strength with the 125 GeV Higgs. And you can see where all these points fall. None of them spectacular enough necessarily for you to say something. But the combination of all of them giving you this and then the fact that CMS, the other experiment, see something in exactly the same place, making us very confident at this point that we have this particle. Here is um, Fabiola Giannotti, who was our spokesperson at the time um, for Atlas, and Joanne Candela, who's an American spokesperson of the CMS experiment, at the announcement of this particle in um, 2012. Very tired-looking Yale undergraduates who <laughs> camped out all night the night before. They biked in from France, where they were staying for the summer, and they camped out all night before. And I can say this because I'm not talking to any of their parents, I hope. They stayed through fire alarms and chants with CMS and wars and, and got the front row seats of the open CERN um, presentation, and they do look very tired. <laughs> but I'm sure they were excited. Okay, so what's next? I have to say that that this, the Higgs we have a Higgs boson. We're confident that we have a Higgs boson. It's looking and acting like a Higgs boson. The question that we have now is, is it the standard model Higgs boson, or is it maybe something else? And the dream is that it's not the standard model Higgs boson. The reality is it's a bit depressing to find the standard model Higgs boson. That may seem crazy, because now we have an explanation for mass for fundamental particles. But we also have that 96% of the universe that we don't understand. We don't have the dark matter candidate, we don't have a reason for dark energy, and um, we would like it if the explanation for mass also gave us a hint into the rest of the universe, and it hasn't been helpful that way. Um, so, I don't want to end on a depressing note, though. The LHC, we're only running in half of our design energy, all right? We've taken a tenth of the data that we expect to take. It really still does have the potential to revolutionize our understanding of physics. Um, and if nothing else, we certainly have something that looks an awful lot like the standard model Higgs boson, and is certainly a Higgs boson. And thank you very much to the UVM Physics Department for letting me come back, and for all of you for your attention.
Chow Chow group, so one of the Hague searches, um, my co-convener is in Australia. So 3 o'clock in the morning are my meetings every other Thursday, which is really fun. It was actually at CERN last week, which was awesome, because it was 9 a.m. and it was light out when I got up for my meeting. It was great. So I guess you have the jet lag, right? Um, so yeah, I, I have a research group. We're looking at the Higgs to Tau Tau case, one of the many channels. Higgs to Tau Tau is really interesting because um, if this really is a standard or supersymmetric Higgs boson, or if there is supersymmetry, I'm going to keep talking even though I'm not making sense now. At high tangent beta, in some region of SUSY parameter space, you have preferential decays to Taus. Okay, so they're a probe. But in general, I would say I'm a, uh, I use Taus as a probe to look for physics beyond the standard model. I have a student who's working on the Z-prime boson search, which would be awesome, and is highly unlikely at this point, given we have an explanation for mass. Um, yeah, a number of things. Yeah. You mentioned you also worked on the trigger. Are I there, do work on the trigger, yeah. Are there any changes to the trigger that potentially happen now that, okay, the case has been discovered, are you going to try and tune the trigger to either look for something else or look for more of certain channels or... Absolutely. So here's what's great about the trigger for the experiment. If you're not looking for it, you're not going to see it, right? That's what's great and terrifying about the trigger for the experiment. So our philosophy with the trigger is to make it as just as, as uh, I don't want to use the word dumb, but just as you know straightforward as we possibly can. It's designed to, to look at objects. So if there's a high energy electron, our trigger will fire. If there's a high energy muon, a high energy tau, our triggers will fire, right? The problem is with the 200 particles that come out of these collisions, you have a lot of backgrounds, you have a lot of fakes, you have a signal to noise problem. So it's a, a boxing match in the trigger meetings for the hundreds of us who are in there trying to get our own physics interests through and included and coded into the trigger. So that what we want to do is, is there, right? With the standard model Higgs, it's certainly easier in that room to make the argument for the Higgs-related triggers, okay? You've got to give me more bandwidth, guys. I need eight of that 200 hertz so that I can keep triggering on Higgs to tau tau. Because we don't have a great measurement in Higgs to tau tau, it's a fermion, it's important, right? At the same time, like I said, the Higgs is, is one of many things we're doing at the LHC, so we have to be really careful that we don't turn it into just a Higgs machine. It's too early. I mean, there's too much of the universe we don't understand, right? We haven't gotten to 14 TeV. So absolutely, our triggers can be smarter in some instances to just zero in on what we want to see, but we're still trying to be careful about um, not tossing things that might surprise us. You can say, I guess it's more of a still general purpose. You have, you're not, there's no plans to, to there, watch No, it. no you're yet. right to ask the question. We certainly have developed very finely tuned triggers based on the standard model case. But to be honest, we had a couple of those before as well, because we were looking for this thing, right? And our, our, our um, energy limits, our mass exclusions went up to 115 GeV, and the further away from that you got, the less consistent with the standard model. So we were looking for something at that low mass region. The actual the, the experiment that turned out before us, the left at the LHC, had hints of something they thought at 117 GeV right there. So there also were some dedicated triggers there. We also had dedicated triggers for, you know, 200 GED. Yeah? What's it going to take to get your highest TEV amounts? What, what do you have to do to get there? So a lot of it's patience. So it, there are a couple of things that are going on. First of all, since it's not the protons that are colliding, it's the partons inside, it's gathering statistics to allow us to have enough times when we get so lucky that the partons that interacted carried a majority of the you know, energy of the actual protons. So some of this is just being patient and taking data for, for more time, and that in itself lets us reach higher energy scales. Um, we're, we're, the LHC has a plan to run through the, 20, the end of 2030, so uh, it's a long-term schedule. In addition to that, if we could have more powerful magnets that we could afford, if we had high um, temperature superconducting magnets, um, then we would be able to run, we would be able to double, you know, the, the energy of the LHC. Because we have to, the protons are screaming, and we, our magnets are only strong enough to, to keep them steered in with so much speed, right? But if we can crank the magnets up higher, we can keep the acceleration going longer, and we can have higher energy collisions. So, yeah, so that would be another way that we can get to higher energy. 
Another way, I'm actually looking at a different experiment, the mu to e experiment, which looks for um, a muon to electron conversion. Another way to access higher energy is to look for it indirectly. Basically, um, you can see strange phenomena happening um, that would be evidence for stuff happening at really high energy. So this experiment, mu to e, has access to up to 10,000 TeV for certain scenarios of, of possible physics beyond the standard model. So you can indirectly probe it. Of course, it's the most fun to smash things and you know, directly produce. Yeah. Knowing the, the mass of the Higgs boson, does that help the standard particle make any interesting predictions that couldn't without that knowledge? So, that's it, yeah. What does it do for us? Knowing it lets us look at the overall picture that we have. Sorry for the vertigo here. Right? It, it lets us make sense of this picture. It's, it's close enough so that it's consistent here. And it, it buttons up the standard model beautifully. I think it ties things up really nicely, which is really horrendous. Right? <laughs> the standard model working so well, that's just horrific for us. So, yeah, thank you, Higgs boson. I don't know what to say beyond that. I mean, I, you know, a lot of people have said when the electron was discovered, who knew? You know, this, this exotic thing that was maybe shown at World Fair or something, who knew that we would have electricity in our everyday lives? I have no idea if the Higgs knowledge is going to creep in. I, I think that condensed matter physicists in the room maybe, you know, can give us access to how bosons and understanding bosons better and, and um, I, I don't know. From the particle physics explanation, Looking at the Higgs, I don't know. It's just a bummer, I guess. That was nice to find a particle. The common, you know, knowledge of the exact mass doesn't change anything else in the standard model. Right? Well, I mean, it doesn't modify much the forces and so on. Next the next question. Yeah. Um, what it does is it gives us a target here. So when we're asking the question, is this really the standard model Higgs boson? Because the theorists have looked at supersymmetric theories and they've said the discrepancies you're going to get may only be at the level of 1 or 2% in terms of the, the ways that this thing is going to decay. So having that target of where it is lets us test each of these predictions of the standard model very carefully, so the game's not over. Right? That's helpful, I guess. You said there was a the next question over here. I just wonder if you have other knobs to turn except for energy typically. Can you pre-prepare states that may not have pretty much this energy? Um, well, you mean like polarization or something? The LHC wasn't built for that. One thing that does happen there is um, lead-lead collisions and lead-proton collisions. So the, one of the four experiments, one of the four collision sites, ELISE, is dedicated heavy ion experiment. They're looking for quark gluon plasma, so really high energy densities. Um, but no, I mean, it's, it's amazing this thing works with what it's doing as it is. I'm not aware of other. We're certainly um, looking at upgrades to maybe do what we call luminosity leveling. Um, so basically controlling the angles that the beams are crossing each other to hang on to the beam for longer periods. But that requires an upgrade in money, so a lot of different things are on the table. Yeah, I don't know. More questions? <coughs> well, I'm a molecular biologist, so I'm actually fascinated by heterogeneity, and so I'm wondering, and so we, in biology, we have more than one way to make a mass. So I'm wondering if, this is not perhaps a naive question, but could this just could be a heterologous mass of smaller masses that accumulates at this at this one particular 125 GeV, and then the decay is actually just the separation of all these individually amalgamated particles? Is okay. That... So um, first of all, there are still people who are hopeful that the Higgs itself is a composite particle, that it's not a fundamental particle, right? And that's something that people are looking at. Is this not a fundamental particle? Does it have substructure? Okay. And it's going to be a while before we can probe that in any meaningful way. Um, I mean, it's, the, the issue here is this, this plot, where you start to see all these different decay chains. Oops, sorry. Right? I mean, to have it line up so well with these exact predictions makes it harder and harder to... It's, it's kind of an Occam's razor argument, right? It's, it's smelling so much like a Higgs. We'll have to see what happens to all of these measurements if they line up in that way. Um, I don't know what physics would give you bound states of these kinds of particles or produce something that looks like that. Um, so we just have to keep making these measurements and then think about what a composite Higgs would look like in our detector and how can we probe that. Last question. 
Um, in terms of string theory, what does the Higgs boson mean? So, in terms of string theory, right, string theory is one of our great hopes for a grand unified theory, right? Yeah. Which is kind of an aesthetic argument. We have these four fundamental forces. We'd like to be able to express them as one, particularly at high energy. Um, string theory has, in, in every, every um, version of it that I've seen, has as a foundational principle basically supersymmetry. Yes. So that's why we're going hunting for supersymmetry. Supersymmetry gives us five Higgs bosons, and it may be that, one of, that, that this Higgs that we found is one of those five. So we're hunting for the other, you know, hoping and hunting for the other Higgs bosons. Um, in terms of supersymmetry and string theory, even if this is, um, even if we can't access supersymmetry at the scales that we can now achieve in terms of energy, it could still be lurking at higher energy scales. So we can't rule out string theory. We are looking for large extra dimensions. So we were directly probing string theory. The string theory is just to be in a lot of trouble as non-scientists even, right? Beautiful mathematical theory. Particles, vibrational modes of strings, that's gorgeous. But if I can't test it, it's meaningless. If it's philosophy, it's not physics. Well, some of them have re reformed in a big way and have testable predictions now. We're going looking for and ruling out regions of, of string theory parameter space at the LHC, okay? And the idea here is that if we have a collision, you could imagine particles escaping into extra dimensions. And this is not Star Trek, I'm being serious here, right? Particles escaping into extra dimensions, and that would leave a, a misbalance in terms of momentum in the detector. So we're going hunting for string theory. Um, I think it's beautiful. I would be, yeah. I think the bottom line is, we do need a different way of thinking about the nature of a fundamental particle, right? We're missing such a huge swath of the universe, and string theory is just a gorgeous twist on what a particle even is. So, here's hoping. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, thanks, Sarah.